I really tried with with this 80s hair. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure that the products used to achieve these kinds of looks back in the day are no longer FTC approved. My hair literally looks wet with how much spray I've put into it. And it doesn't even have half the life in it that Catherine Newton's did in this movie. I mean, I know she was wearing a wig, but still. I just can't believe our grandmothers were choking on these fumes every goddamn day. Wow. <coughs> Maybe that's why her character was wearing sunglasses indoors sometimes, because maybe that shields from the hairspray. <laughs> <coughs> Hello and welcome to one of the stupidest things I've ever done. Hi, my name is Kylie. I also go by Haunted Hippie on this YouTube channel. Land of chaotic openings and cult worship. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm the Antichrist. I'm Satan's favorite daughter. It's really good to meet you. If you would like to join us here, then all you have to do is click subscribe. Also click the like button and the notification bell. That way you never miss our next meeting. Today, I'm here to talk about Lisa Frankenstein. And I'm really excited because it's been a hot minute since we've gotten a movie like this. Don't worry, I'm gonna get into all my spoiler-free thoughts first because I know that most of you probably did not go out and see this opening weekend. But then a little later on, I am gonna get into some spoiler territory because how can I not with this movie? If you've seen it, you know. If you know, you know. So you'll be safe for a little while and then I will warn you once spoilers begin. Oh, maybe I should flip my hair. Maybe that'll do it. Hold on. Woo! I also haven't washed my hair in like three days, so maybe the oil is kind of weighing it down. <sighs> okay. Oop, nope. Are we there yet? Did we do it? <laughs> no, no, but it's fine. <laughs> so before I even talk about my spoiler thoughts, I need to sort of set the stage, you know? What, what were my thoughts going into this movie, first of all? Because I feel like that's relevant. I was very much looking forward to this movie and I knew pretty much nothing about it. I knew that the main character would be some kind of like morbid weird girl. I also was expecting it to be kind of like a gothic romance, but I had the plot all wrong because I don't watch trailers for movies that I'm excited about. I knew that it was written by Diablo Cody who wrote Juno and she wrote Jennifer's Body. I was like, say less. Also the directorial debut of Zelda Williams, Robin Williams' daughter, that's cool. All right, sign me up. I was super excited that it was starring Katherine Newton because she has been an unsung hero of the horror genre for like over a decade, I wanna say. I think starting with the fourth Paranormal Activity movie, which I enjoy the first half of that movie. I don't think it's as bad as everyone says. She's really good in it. She's fun to watch. She starred in Freaky several years back. She's also also gonna be in Radio Silence's Abigail, which I'm super pumped for. I had very little reservations about her. We'll get into that in a second. My main reservation going into this movie was, oh, they cast Cole Sprouse. <laughs> the Cole Sprouse who recently was on a podcast and started chain smoking indoors. That Cole Sprouse? It's fine. Everyone's smoking weed in like a studio. But and not a fucking like, cigarette. Tobacco and everyone gets like this. It's fine. It's Fine. He's supposed to be the uh, the undead heartthrob in this film. <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, um, interesting casting. I really did not think that they were successfully gonna be able to sell him to me as someone that would end up as desirable. I have not been a fan of his for a very long time since I watched The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody when I was a child. I watched the first season of Riverdale and then he had his whole like, I'm a weirdo monologue. Do you remember that? In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in and I don't want to fit in. Have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on? That's weird. I know it's not relevant. I still quote that. Genuinely have not seen a single thing he's done in between then and now. Beside the clips from that podcast where he's just like holding his cigarette and is, you know, talking like, talking like his character in Riverdale. So I was like, okay, Zelda Williams, you've created quite a task for yourself. Let's see how you do. And why did he end up having my favorite performance of the entire movie? Oh, it's, that's sinister. We'll get more into why in a little bit, but Catherine Newton, let me just talk about my one reservation here. She's not weird enough. I'm sorry. I don't know why in this movie and also in Freaky, Christopher Landon tried to do the same thing. Why do they try to convince me that it's like, yeah, nobody nobody sees this poor, tortured, blonde, blue-eyed, <laughs> skinny girl. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. She has brown hair and Lisa Frankenstein. It's not going to happen. Stop trying to make Fetch happen. I understand they're trying to go for the Wednesday effect. And yes, Jenna Ortega has completely changed the movie industry. That's a video for another day. It's it's like weird girls are in, but they're afraid to take it there. Where are my fellow real freaks at? All right, can we step up to that right now? They make her seem weird because what? She likes to spend time outdoors in an abandoned graveyard. That graveyard is beautiful. 
Like, I don't, nothing about that red is weird to me. Okay, she doesn't have a lot of friends, but she just moved and high school's weird. Not to act like I'm competing in the weird Olympics or anything, but at the age of four years old, I was cutting bees in half when they were mid-flight. I love bees. I, tr I save them from the swimming pool now, but when I was four, I had no concept of life and death. What? I was a toddler. It's genuinely one of my earliest memories. I would go out with scissors and it's like, oh, flying thing. You cut it in half. Whoop, it doesn't fly anymore. I would lift up rocks in my backyard to look for slugs so that I could turn them into slug puree. I'd mash them between two rocks. Like, I get that this movie is kind of supposed to be for me, for teenage me, but sh she's not weird enough. Like, why do they still try to make weird girls so soft and marketable? In Jennifer's body, they actually really took it there, which I feel like is kind of why the movie flopped at the time. That and the marketing, like, we know this by now. But the other, like, weirdest trait they gave this girl was that her mom died. We got the dead mom trope. Like, boo! Boo! In the year of our Lord and Antichrist 2024, we're doing the dead mom trope. And one of the biggest problems with that is that was sort of the extent of the lore of our lead character. The world building was very, very poor. So the first act of the movie, I wasn't really having a good time. I did not find it funny because like, I just, I wasn't grounded enough with these characters. I didn't get to know anyone well enough. So in that way, like the humor didn't hit because I'm like, is it actually funny for this character to be saying this. Like, I don't know. Also, I could understand that we were in the 80s, but it was a very shiny, kind of like colorful, pumped up version, sort of like what I'm doing today. Although this is actually a, a vintage jacket. It comes with, it has shoulder pads in it and everything. Anyways, the world building just was like not great. So you're not exactly sure when and where you are and what inspired the choice to even have this be a period piece. But then once you finally understand the world about halfway through, then it picks up and it gets so much fun. My mood really changed about halfway through and I started loving it. At the beginning of the movie, throughout the first act, I was like, "Is am I watching like a one and a half star, two star movie right now? But then by the ending, I was like, oh, four stars. Loved it, loved it. But it's still kind of a problem because if you've seen like some of the marketing and stuff or you've seen what people are saying online where a lot of people are comparing it to Jennifer's body and it's like, oh, Catherine Newton, she totally gets her Jennifer's body moment, whatever. Definitely Jennifer vibes. And it's like, yeah, sort of, but it's not earned and not at all. Th literally just a switch is flipped. So it's not very satisfying, but it still makes sense because obviously like she, she gets very hot and goth, but it's like she already was hot. So you're not, it's not a surprise. If it was more drastic and there was more insecurity from her in the beginning and it was like kind of gradual and then she has the big moment, then I'd be like, okay. But it's li quite literally like, a switch is flipped. That's kind of what I mean by lack of world building. Even the main character is not fully fleshed out. Also, sorry, I told, I'm gonna keep touching my hair. I, t I gotta try to keep this volume. Also, I could tell they were trying to get their mileage out of Carla Gugino. Come, like, how can you not? That woman. <sighs> She, she is everything to me. I feel like out of all the characters in the movie, I'm kind of emulating her most right now, but it just, I don't know, something wasn't clicking there. I do have to remind myself and try not to complain too much about this though, that a lot of the jokes were not told for me. And by me, I mean a 24 year old. This is a PG-13 movie and do I wish that it was R? Do I wish that it was a little bit more daring and a little bit more funny, a little bit more graphic? Absolutely. But I also recognize that adult society has taken pretty much everything away from children. They have no free places to hang out. There is nothing free that they can do except be on the internet. Let's not take away their PG-13 fun too, like, right? So I get that it was geared a little bit more towards them, but I bring this up a lot. So many of my favorite movies are Pixar movies. They don't feel like they're geared towards children. I mean, if you take Soul, for example, the main character is like a 40-something jazz music musician. It's obviously not really a story for children and all of the humor in the movie can be read not just for kids. Like there's probably a few jokes that are thrown in there for the kids in the audience, but most of the jokes adults can still appreciate. That is what I don't understand about the writing of a lot of PG and PG-13 content these days. Why is it so dumbed down? Children know what's going on. Like they're so much smarter than they get credit for. In fact, a lot of them I think are way more in tune with the world 
than most adults, but that, you know what, conversation for another day. I haven't seen Juno in a long time, but the writing definitely is on brand for Diablo Cody, because a lot of the humor in Jennifer's body, I feel like, doesn't really stick with me either. But some of it absolutely does. I mean, that movie is bonkers over the top. <laughs> Excuse me. And really the only major difference between Jennifer's body and Lisa Frankenstein is just maybe like the gore and some of the language. Conceptually and tonally, extremely similar. So I guess I just don't understand why a lot of the writing was not quite up to that same standard as well. Overall though, like I said, by the time I walked out of the movie, it was four stars. Like I had very few complaints by the end. I literally cried. Like I got home last night and I was gonna film like my closet clean out video that I've been working on for my vlog channel and my makeup was all messed up. And I was like, oh yeah, that's because I started sobbing. Little Kylie, even though this movie was not quite weird enough for her, was just so happy that a movie was being made for her at all. Number one, thank you Jenna Ortega for changing the movie industry. And thank you to Greta Gerwig for Barbie. Thank you for proving yet again that, oh, shocker, women go to the movie theater. We love having stories that are centered around us, women. Unbelievable that women make up half the population of the earth and we are still begging for scraps. Anyway, do these studio execs ever sit down and think like, huh, why did this movie make a billion dollars? Must be because of the toys. Let's make more toy movies, idiots. This movie is 100% for the girlies. The girlies that felt a little bit weird and a little bit out of place when they were in high school. But I don't, I don't want to go full on and say like, this is for the goth girls. But you know, as I've been saying, it is the mainstream version of that. I would say that a movie for the real weird girls, Ginger Snaps. I just want to mention that so you can kind of manage your expectations if we have a similar sense of taste, but I still loved it. So whatever. Overall, um, it's kind of bad, but it's so fun and it's so well intentioned and I loved it. Struck a chord with my inner child. Go see it for Valentine's Day. Bring your goth girlfriend. Go by yourself. That's what I did. Although I think that I'm going to make my boyfriend go with me to go see it again, probably before the month is up. And that is that on that. So if you haven't seen the movie, I'm going to get into spoilers so you will no longer be safe. Go see the movie. I will be waiting right here for you when you get back. So the first act, why was the first act not good? All the lack of world building, as I mentioned, and the fact that we literally start with the scene of her in the bathroom and she's kind of mismatched her blush shade, whatever. They're trying to convince us that she's not gorgeous. It's fine. But then they get to the party and she gets dosed with something and this was not taken over the top enough. I really don't think that we should sanitize drug use for teenagers because on the one hand, it just rings completely untrue. Speaking as a teenager that experimented, my dumbass got myself into some scary sh and I don't think that that scene encapsulated that well enough. We'll get into something I think they did well, but when she starts tripping out and they want it to seem like she's starting to panic or something, they do not take it there. And I understand that to keep a PG-13 rating, they can't do that. But the way that it came off, because it seems so sanitized and like, oh, when you get really high, when you get dosed with something crazy, all that happens is things get kind of wavy and people's voices sound weird. How is a teenager gonna watch that and think, oh, I will say no. And also, I don't doubt Catherine Newton's acting ability, but the way that it was shot and everything and kind of sanitized, it made it seem like Catherine Newton has never been high in her life. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Also, maybe it's because I just recently rewatched Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and the bar for a drug vendor and its depiction is very, very high, but it wasn't working. That, that was not done well. I also kind of failed to see the point. Like it was only a plot vehicle for the nasty that almost happened. And speaking of that, let's uh, tangent, no, let's, let's switch topics. You would think that by now I'd maybe be like, okay, Diablo Cody, let's switch lanes. Let's maybe have a fun fantasy movie that does not involve sexual violence. Let's maybe have a true escapist movie, but no, I am glad that it was included here. And I will continue to be when it's not exploitative. I will continue to be when it is this subtle because how many times do we need to put this shit in movies before men 
men are like, oh, I am the villain. They haven't learned yet and girls still need to be warned about it. So I don't know what you want me to say. I also knew that it meant that that character would come back around because I can count on Diablo Cody. I can't count on Emerald Fennel, never will. But Diablo Cody, oh, I knew that he would come back around. I knew that he would see his comeuppance. Oh, the sweet, sweet moral fable that sexual offenders deserve death. My favorite. Consent is actually not a difficult concept to understand and I'm so glad that teenagers will have movies like this now because I feel like a lot of, you know, like the 80s rom-coms and stuff that I grew up on, a lot of them have what, as Robin Thicke would say, blurred lines. So I think we need things that are a little bit more morally explicit like this, especially for teenagers. Especially with the rise of figures like Andrew Tate, like watch what your children are doing on the internet for the love of God. Ugh, boys are so much easier to raise than girls. Love being a boy mom. Um, you're raising rapists, so. Anyways, let's move on from that. Let me, let me get to the exact moment that I knew that this movie actually was gonna be for me, and it was when Carla Gugino died. I never thought that I'd say those words, absolutely not. I thought that she would be missed, but she, uh, you know what? She did her job. She did such a good job at being a character that I didn't like that I did not miss her when she was gone. Normally, I mean, like in the fall of the House of Usher, when she's playing a, you know, a more sinister character, you love seeing that side of her. But she did her job so well in Lisa Frankenstein that I was like, ugh. Okay, bye. As soon as the movie became about killing people to get their body parts so that she could sew him back together again, I was like, yes. <laughs> the gates of hell opened up and I felt the warm fires. I was like, yes. Cole Sprouse's physical comedy also, like some of it not perfect, but a lot of it I found really, really enjoyable because you know, just based on like the that chain smoking video, that's so embarrassing. I didn't think that he had it in him to drop his ego and do something this kind of weird. And something this gross, you know, he looks disgusting for majority of the movie. He doesn't look handsome until the very end, but he's like, you know, spitting worms up out of his mouth and stuff. That's fun. Also, did Carla Gugino actually put a worm in her mouth? Because that's what it looked like. And if so, props. My goddamn hair is flat again. I can't. I This this is driving me crazy. Were girls just doing this to their hair all the time? But he was really good and he ended up having my favorite performance in the movie because I did not know that he had that type of silent performance in him. He's such a yapper, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, he's set the bar for Jacob Elordi, you know, he's he's giving him a run for his big ass money. He, he's got to be the Frankenstein monster soon. And you know, who not? We'll see if he can co even compare. <laughs> Oh my god, I couldn't even make that joke without laughing. I'm kidding. Jacob Elordi is about to change the name of the Frankenstein monster, but he did really good. She's really good. And it was to the point where like, I really was caring about their relationship and I cried at the end because his performance was actually so earnest. He and Catherine Newton have excellent chemistry. I saw Catherine Newton, I think on one of the, one of the Jimmy's shows or maybe on Stephen Colbert, whatever, one of those white comedians. And she was saying how she was such a big fan of him when she was a kid. And she even met him at some restaurant and they took a picture together when they were kids. So I just know that she was geeking out and that I think really lent itself to their chemistry because they just seemed to be having a really, really good time together. Like it felt so genuine and it was just a joy. It was such a, it was a joy to watch. Now the moment that I knew that this would be a four star film, this movie is PG-13 and yet we get to witness Cole Sprouse hacking off another man penis. Can I get some snaps in the chat? What? Laughing my ass off then, laughing my ass off when he silently put her hand on his crotch and was like, mm. <laughs> See, <laughs> I don't have a penis. And then ugh, their little love scene. I love how it was portrayed with like the animation and stuff. But the only confusing thing to me about that is like, why was there a scene earlier where she used the vibrator in the bed with him? Cause he was like giving her a back massage and then she was like, I can use it somewhere else. But at that point she like, their relationship wasn't sensual. So that confused me. I'm like, she just masturbated in front front of him, but she still wants to pursue this other man. Like, it was just a little bit weird. I've never, I've never done that in front of my friends. Did that moment confuse any of you? Let me know. And then I do love the kind of Romeo and Juliet moment where she bursts into flames uh, in the tanning bed. That did get me. Like I said, I was crying by that point. But then 
I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you. The last scene of the movie, we're coming up on Cole Sprouse and he's speaking. <laughs> he's reading poetry and you remember, oh yeah, Cole Sprouse can talk. And he just, I'm sorry, he has the look, he has the right look for an undead 19th century man. But does he have the voice? Does he have the voice to recite poetry and make it feel romantic and meaningful? <laughs> that was a little bit of an ick. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I think they could have done something else. I really truly feel like he should have had no dialogue at all in this movie, but it fit the moment. It, it was the only thing that really made sense there. And then we reveal, of course, Lisa is there and she's all burnt up and she opens her eyes and she's very clearly blind because her eyeballs have been burned out of the sockets. And the implication is that they will go off and they will start murdering more people to replace her body parts. How beautiful. We love it. Finn, the end. Another thing too that I like about the ending is that she thanks her stepsister for being the type of person that didn't look through her because typically the cheerleader type, whatever, normally they do. I really, really enjoyed the subversion of that trope. Well, uh, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't completely subvert it though, did they? Because she stole the man that she had a crush on and she still was kind of the like super shallow, oh, I'm too pretty, it's so hard. But she was a genuinely nice person, which at least they gave her that. I would love for Diablo Cody to write a script where there is no cattiness between the female characters. I had the same best friend for the last 20 years. We met in preschool when we were four years old. Not a lick of betrayal in the last two decades. It is possible. So let's get rid of the dead mom trope. Let's get rid of the catty girl trope. Please, once and for all, let's put it to bed. Overall, I recognize that I have so many complaints about the movie and overall, in terms of actual quality, it's like, I don't know, a two and a half, three star film. But in terms of my enjoyment, the way my soul was fed, four stars, absolutely. I loved it, can't wait to go see it again, can't wait to own it on Blu-ray, can't wait to show it to my daughters when they're far too young to see it, etc., etc., etc. That's gonna conclude my review of Lisa Frankenstein. I hope that you've enjoyed your stay here. I've made my hellish realm a little bit more girly, a little bit more Valentine's in pink today. Typically we are burning in hellfire, but I just, I thought I'd switch up the vibe today. If that sounds fun to you though, then I hope that you come back. Remember to click subscribe if you haven't already, the like button, the notification bell. Also, check out the other links in the description box. I have a vlog channel. Recently, I went and I stayed in the most haunted hotel in California. That was super fun. I also talk about physical media over there and I have a Patreon where I tell you guys what I'm working on in terms of my own films. And there's also just bonus content over there that doesn't make it to the main channels. You can also check out my social media, whatever you please. Go have fun. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye.